Welcome everyone. Uh, I acknowledge and pay respect to the tra traditional owners and elders past and present of the lands and waters on which Monash University operates. At MARTA, we acknowledge Aboriginal connection to material and creative practice on these lands for more than 60,000 years and celebrate their enduring presence and knowledge. So welcome everyone here. It's a great turnout. Um, we have uh, three amazing speakers, um, uh, Kimberly Moulton, Shane Nicholas and Atom Atem. And I'm just going to both introduce the event um, and talk a little bit, bit about my practice uh, and then um, open it up to the speakers to also talk about their practice and also uh, address the topic. And then we're going to open up for uh, discussion at the end from your questions um, in the chat box. Uh, and if there are no questions, I'll open it up and ask questions. So uh, today we're here to look at the ideas about demystifying contemporary art. And what is contemporary art? Can it be defined and is it for everyone? So I did um, look up, uh, I did a Google search of what contemporary art is identified as, you know, um, and from the John Paul Getty Museum, they say, strictly speaking, the term contemporary art refers to art made and produced by artists living today. Uh, today's artists work in and respond to a global environment that is culturally diverse, techn technologically advancing and multifaceted. Working in a wide range of mediums, contemporary artists often reflect and comment on modern day society. I think that's a really important defi definition. Um, uh, there would also, uh, there are also um, uh, questions about um, is a work of art good or is the work aesthetically pleasing? And they're asking you to uh, um, consider whether art is challenging or interesting. I would put my educator's hat on and ask what is the work trying to say when you look at um, a work in a gallery or in a public um, site, what is its scale? What is it made from? Where is it located? How is it installed? Um, and what are the images that are being represented? Uh, so I'm just going to um, share this screen and just talk briefly about my practice. Since 2008, um, my work has mainly focused on looking at remembrance and um, uh, and also uh, translating spaces for um, contemplation for audiences to um, contemplate. I am the daughter of a, a Hungarian-born Holocaust survivor, and I was very, very aware that um, uh, I never heard my father's a uh, story of survival firsthand. He died when I was a teenager. And I was very aware that when I found out about his history and I traveled to monuments in Eastern Europe about how, as a child of a survivor, how can you speak for those that cannot speak any longer? Um, because they either didn't survive um, or uh, they lived and then they didn't tell their story. They didn't, um, uh, yeah. So this work is in the exhibition Know My Name. This is called Memorial Gardens. Okay. And um, I'm showing a range of images because to acknowledge the audience uh, of my practice. Um, and this was a commission I did for Kanye West in Los Angeles. Um, in his home. Uh, this is um, my monument, Black Cube. I've worked in synthetic fur because I was interested in the emotional content in software imagery. And I was also aware it's the exact opposite of how you would um, imagine a monument or a memorial to be. I'm interested in the comfort and protection of this material. This. Um, it, work is, was in Anna Schwartz Gallery in 2008. Um, this is the Monument Project, Black Wall at the Gus Fisher Gallery in New Zealand. Um, the Monument Project, Black Feet. Oh. 
and uh, memorial, my memorial oral histories, which is an archive that um, I've turned into an artwork, not uh, intending it to be an artwork. It was traveling and listening to people's stories. I have access to a lot of survivors that I've recorded their stories. I was interested in recording people's stories because I never got to do this with my father firsthand. Um, I did a residency in New Zealand and I was very aware that there were a lot of child survivors in New Zealand and I recorded their, their stories or their um, uh, descendant stories and I made a bench uh, as a result of that. And it's a public artwork that I did for the city of Stonington. So my work is really divided into two parts, looking at memory and history and looking at gardens in relationship to memory and history and gardens uh, in relationship to domesticity and um, interior uh, smaller scale works and public artwork. Um, this is an exhibition called Pet Cemetery, also at Anna Schwartz Gallery, um, where all the pets' names were human names um, and were named actually after people, people's pets and my own pets. Uh, this is public artwork, um, the Chancellery Garden, Chancellery Column Seat at Monash University at, outside the Chancellery Building. And I've done, done a koala tram, the koala tram. Um, again, a lot of my work has looked at identity and relationship to both popular culture um, and domestic influences, interior design references, as well as remembrance. So the tram was part of that. So as Esther mentioned, I was recently uh, wonderfully awarded um, the, one of the six <laughs> winners of the Melbourne Prize for Urban Sculpture. Uh, this Prize for Urban Sculpture is um, normally $60,000 for one winner. And we realised that there were no First Nations um, uh, uh, shortlisted. Um, artists, and there were no representations um, of First, First Nation voices on the panel. And we had the opportunity to enter into discussion and do something about this as a group. Uh, we all agreed that it was, you know, given um, we've come out of, well, we're still in um, COVID-19, uh, the impacts that that's had for everyone, both financially, emotionally, um, spatially, we decided it was just a no-brainer to, to split this award. So there was no one winner. And also to make a change for the board to uh, move forward in, in this just being um, a given that there was a represent representative on the panel uh, moving forward of First Nations people so that there would be more comfort comfortability for everyone to apply. And also given this is a public art prize, usually it's um, set up at Federation Square, uh, to not acknowledge the history of the land or the, the site. Um, they do acknowledge this, but um, this just wasn't in the dialogue. Um, uh, and for this year, it has been in different dialogues for um, other years uh, for the music prizes, but um, uh, so we, we were able to do something different and um, we are, uh, we've divided the money and we are donating uh, a seventh prize to um, a First Nations um, organisation of which we're doing tomorrow. So, um, so that's my talk. I'm going to, how do I unshare, stop share? Okay. So I'm acknowledging, um, you know, the audiences that, all of um, us here that are talking today, um, we reach very many different audiences through what we do. And um, I'm going to introduce Kimberly Moulton as the next speaker. She's a Yorta Yorta woman, curator and writer. She's the senior curator of the Southeastern Aboriginal Collections at Museums Victoria and Art Artistic Associate Rising Melbourne. Her practice works in decolonial methodology and the intersection of research, community-driven projects, contemporary and historical art and cultural material, which extends to both the museum and contemporary art space. She has written extensively for, public, for art publications nationally and internationally, 
and curated projects independently in Australia and America. In 2020, Moulton was co-editor of the ArtLink Indigenous Edition, 40.2, Kin Constellations, Languages, Waters, Futures. She is deputy chair of the Shepparton Art Museum Board, board member for Bartha Dilla oh. Foundation and the AICA Australia International Association of Art Critics. So, Kimberly. Thank you, Cathy. Um, so I'd also like to acknowledge the country that I'm um, living and working on, which um, I'm in Brunswick at the moment, so on Wurundjeri country of the Kulin Nation, um, but also pay my respects to Wurundjeri, uh, Woiwurrung and Bunwurrung peoples of, of Melbourne. Um, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a curator, um, writer. I am senior curator at Melbourne Museum um, for the First Peoples Collection that I um, focus on the sort of Southeastern collection there, which uh, is New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, and a little bit of South Australia. So as part of my role at the museum, I work with um, both cultural heritage and um, historical materials, but also contemporary works um, in the collection. And, and part of my practice there is really addressing the gap of, um, you know, the lack of contemporary works that we have and, and contemporary representation of, of First Peoples culture in that space. Um, my, my practice uh, in the museum is sort of, I, I didn't come in as an anthropologist or a, a historian. I have a, a contemporary art or an art background. Um, and I, I sort of, I guess I sit in this intersection um, with what I do in, in terms of my interest is historical materials and cultural material, but also contemporary art and contemporary First Peoples art and sort of how that works within the institution um, outside of it, how, you know, our ethnographic collecting and, and the ancestral belongings that sit within institutions, how that legacy and, and that has informed uh, contemporary art today around notions of authenticity um, and acquisition um, and representation in these institutions. So that's sort of where I sit, I suppose, in, in my area of um, interest, but I, I do a lot of different things at Melbourne Museum. Um, I started in Bunjalaka in the Aboriginal Cultural Centre um, around 2008 and I was the project officer and curator for the contemporary art gallery that is within the cultural centre within the museum um, and I was there for about eight years working with Victorian Aboriginal artists uh, and then I moved into this role um, a few years ago in the senior curatorial role that, that really looks across the entire Southeastern collection. So um, also working at the museum, I, um, I've just recently started as a role, uh, in a role rather, at Rising Festival. So Rising is the Melbourne International Arts Festival and uh, White Night that has been combined and sort of reimagined under the artistic direction of um, Hannah Fox and um, Gideon Obazanik. Um, and that's a really exciting role where I'm working with the artistic directors um, in an associate capacity and, and kind of overseeing a lot of the um, First Nations programming for the festival and also working with amazing artists like Atong um, and, and other, you know, Jason Fu and, and a lot of really, you know, amazing um, contemporary Australian artists. So it's, it's a real... Um, honour and, and pleasure to be sort of working in that space and it's very interesting coming out of an institution and working curatorially in, in much more of an ephemeral kind of festival, um, you know, way. Um, so it's been really, it's, it's sort of interesting to, to work with artists um, outside of the White Cube, outside of what institutions do um, in terms of museums and galleries and that kind of hang and that that exhibition approach um, in that space and and moving into rising um i'm i'm a yoda yoda woman so um i grew up in shepparton in country victoria and i've been in melbourne for about 17 years now i went to monash university to um do my undergraduate and um my people are um from sort of northeastern victoria and I'm a James and a Cooper, so I um, I grew up, you know, with a lot of art and a lot of politics and a lot of um, sort of community around me in, in Shepparton and 
Uh, my family have been very involved um, in Aboriginal uh, rights movements and, and education and, and art as well um, and continue to be in lots of different ways. Um, my, my great uncle is William Cooper and he was a, an activist um, and had a very strong connection to the Jewish um, community, of course, with his protests around Kristallnacht. Um, and, you know, my family, my great great grandfather, and, and he started the first um, Aboriginal rights um, group for Australia, which is the Australian Aborigines League, which um, was established in Footscray. Um, so I sort of have a, a background in all of that culturally um, and family, but stepped into to arts and culture. Um, I guess my, my practice, you know, I was talking about, I guess, that intersection of contemporary art and, and cultural material and ancestral belongings. I, I call these objects, some people call them artefacts. Um, I call them ancestral belongings. They're, you know, our um, cultural materials um, that uh, are much more than just an uh, artefact in the historic past. Um, but, you know, I'm really interested in the way that we can indigenize these spaces and, and create anti-colonial spaces within institutions. Um, you know, decolonization is obviously something I'm very interested in, but I'm also working through that and, and what that means today um, for us as Aboriginal people within these spaces um, and, and really sort of challenging the ongoing colonial project that many of these institutions continue um, as well. So how we do that through art and how we do that through engaging artists and, and contemporary makers um, in that space and, and also challenging this sort of binary of like what a museum should do and what a, an art gallery should do. And I think working in Aboriginal art um, and, and culture it's, is, is that, it's, it's culture, it's, it's this holistic kind of all-encompassing thing um, that works in both spaces. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I might hand it over to someone else now. Okay. Sort of Thank you, Kimberly. We'll come back to you. Don't worry. There's so much there. That was fantastic. Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce Shane Nicholas, uh, who's a multidisciplinary artist interested in exploring the space between technology and humanity. He gained a Master of Fine Art from the BCA, University of Melbourne in 2018, and having completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts painting in 2003. He has exhibited his work regularly in both solo and group exhibitions nationally. He recently won the 2020 Tom Bass Prize for Figurative Sculpture in 2017, and he won the Peter Redlich Memorial Prize for his master's exhibition. Nicholas was also a finalist for the Linden Art Prize 2019 and the Incinerator Art for Social Change Award in 2018. So welcome, Shane. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, which is the Wurundjeri people. I'm in Emerald at the moment. Um, just moved here recently. Um, so, yes, um, my um, artwork, I might show some slides to make it a little easier to, to see what I'm talking about. I'm hoping we can see that. Uh, so that was um, my master's show, and that that show I thought was pretty relevant because that was looking at, um, you know, the way data is processed. Um, and I was looking into, because, you know, the way data is collected um, and processed and, and used by the companies that collect big data. And, um, you know, and the interesting thing about um, the, you know, information and algorithms that are used to sort information because you can't sort information that much information manually you need algorithms is they're developed with a set of values there's they're, they're developed with a um a mindset and so um and that mindset is going to make a whole lot of assumptions and so um what's interesting about and you look into the way these algorithms work they're often often quite exclusive and they, um, they don't consider many perspectives. So, and I sort of came to the conclusion that they, they seem technology has sort of taken this, uh, it's almost taken its, um, its pathway from the Renaissance and it's taken this sort of um, humanist view, which is sort of a, a, 
a Western sort of um, humanist view, which sort of sees the um, European male as being the um, at the centre of that universe. Hence why at the centre of that exhibition you've got, you know, a reference to um, the Vitruvian man. Um, but this time it's a, a new version of the Vitruvian man, um, which I, um, which is me. Um, I 3D scanned myself um, using a, um, like a, a, a Kinect scanner. It's for a um, video game console. Uh, you can hack it to 3D scan with. And um, I put, I, I put my arm in two positions at different times and um, and whatever distortions occurred were distortions that happened from um, errors um, in the processing of that. So in a way, it's a, it's a visual representation of the distortion of data, the distortion and, and, and um, segmentation of data. Um, and that's what that whole project was about. It was about looking at you know, how we're seen by technology, how, um, you know, pro you know, how these processes that we're all subject to um, consider us and view us. And of course, it's an exaggeration um, and, and not an actual, you know, an actual vision of that, but it's a vision of, you know, but they are actual visions of distortions that have occurred through the processing of technologies. Um, and, um, that leads me to talk about what I think um, contemporary art or how I consider art to, to function. And I like to draw from um, Julia Christopher's um, example in that she talks about how art and literature, they, they, they go beyond and challenge language. And so I see art as serving a function as sort of opening discussions and, and, and opening thoughts and mindsets beyond what the, the constraints of, of, um, of language, because language is a construct. Um, so um, that's, that's, and so that's why I think you can engage an issue through art and through materials like this, and hopefully um, it can lead to further discussion, further questioning, etc. cetera. And um, in regards to, um, the demystification of art. Um, I also come to that from the perspective of being a TAFE teacher. And I'd also been a high school teacher for years. And so I've come across many issues where people are afraid to enter a contemporary art gallery uh, because they think that it's, you know, it's, it's daunting or it's going to make them look stupid. And I really, um, I would encourage anyone to enter a contemporary art exhibition because um, it is for everyone to see. And, um, and I like to draw from, and I, and I often get my students uh, drawing from referring to um, The Death of the Author by Roland Barnes, because um, <clears throat> that talked about the, um, the removal of the power from the author and, and giving that power to the reader, the reader activating literary works and, and artworks. And so, you know, as, as much as an author is drawing from their accumulated knowledge and experience, the reader does the same. And so um, my four-year-old son will have a different experience of artwork than I will, but there's a validity in that. Um, there's something to draw from that. Uh, and so, you know, not all artwork can consider every culture and mindset, but the reader can. So not, and so that, that in a way, it, it creates this great fusion of, um, of ideas when there's artwork that's presented and then it gets to be processed and, um, and read by the reader. And uh, in regards to um, yeah, reading artwork with my students, I often, much like what Kathy was saying, it is a what, how, when and why scenario. So what, you know, what can you see? Uh, what's it made from? Um, when was it made? And, um, you know, what did the artist think it's about? The artist might think it's about something different than what you think it's about. And there's, there's an interesting conversation there as well. Um, so that's, um, that's my perspective, and I'm happy to hand it on now. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, you've left me with some, some 
questions and answers that I want to continue with. But uh, our third speaker, we're going to go to the third speaker, is Atong Atem, is, who's an Ethiopian-born South Sudanese artist and writer living in now Melbourne. Atem works primarily with photography and video to explore migrant narratives, post-colonial practices in the African diaspora. diaspora and the exploration of identity through portraiture. Atem explores concepts of home and identity through a critical and sentimental lens and references the works of photographers Malik Sabidi, Sadibi and oh, yeah. Seju Kaita or Keita, and science fiction writers such as Octavia Butler as tools for navigating liminal spaces. Atem has exhibited her work across Australia, including Mama Monash, Gertrude Contemporary, Australian Centre for Contemporary Art, and internationally at Red Hook Labs in New York, Vogue Fashion Fair in Milan, and Unseen Amsterdam Art Fair. Atem was the recipient of the inaugural National Gallery of Victoria and Mecca M Power Scholarship in 2018, as well as the Brisbane Powerhouse Melt Portrait Prize in 2018. I do apologise for those um, pronunciations. So a Tom. Tom. Thanks, Cathy. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the land that I'm on, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a Fitzroy North person, which I never thought I would be, but here I am. <laughs> um, I will also share my screen and talk a little bit about my practice, um, if I can. So my work is primarily um, portraiture. I like to sort of explore um, my relationship to portraiture as an artist and what that means uh, in a larger sense. Um, I think I mostly came to making portraiture as a response to going to art school. I initially studied at Sydney University, um, SCA, Sydney College of the Arts, and I did painting initially. Um, and through my art history assignments, I became very quickly disillusioned. I think there's such a, uh, a limit, or there was in my experience anyway, a limit to the breadth of what is considered relevant art history and what kind of practices are considered relevant. Um, so I basically did my own research. I'm really grateful to have access to the internet as a student. Um, and that's where I came across those photographers that I referenced in my bio, um, who were predominantly West African photographers who responded to that history of ethnographic photographs of black people being the initial introduction to black people um, for the majority of the Western world. Um, and unpacking what that ethnographic lens has done, like the kind of damage it's done. Um, and I think for me as a contemporary artist, I'm still reckoning with that personally um, through my work. And as a person in the world, I think there's still a lot of undoing to be done in our relationship to um, the visual arts and the power of visual art to inform, I guess, a mass or global relationship to a people's to, depending on who depicts those peoples. Um, so this work that I'm showing here is uh, part of my studio series, which I made in 2015 as a direct response to that. Um, and these were photographs that I took of friends of mine who also had a relationship to, um, to that history and a relationship to more so the uh, studio photography practice um, as something that felt kitsch almost for us um, and as like a personal way of just exhibiting photos in your living rooms. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, kind of contribute to, in my, I would say contribute to a pre-existing history of art making um, that I felt related to and I felt inspired by but also felt really relevant and felt like a, a, an art history canon that I wanted to exist in. Um, so those works were sort of my first foray into the contemporary art world and they were the first works that I had that were exhibited um, and I, I, I love them. <laughs> um, and from there I sort of unpacked my relationship to photography 
and the identity of a photographer in like an ethical sense and what it actually means, especially as a portrait photographer, to take a photo of someone and therefore frame and kind of present them for consumption, especially within a context of making photographs of black people, which to me feels really intimate, personal and just kind of regular. But when they're exhibited, say, in an art gallery or a museum or a context um, where the people are viewed, I guess, around my practice and my body of work and me as a person and sort of the relationship to the individual and photographing is removed. Um, so this portal series I made as a response to that power and, and the ways that I maybe didn't necessarily do all the right things. Um, I think when we talk of contemporary art and thinking about this panel in the lead up to it, I really had to think about uh, the way that people within the contemporary art sphere or the art sphere in general, we've kind of become super accustomed to um, our own language and the way that we speak about things. And, you know, a lot of us studied at art school and have a really specific way of talking about things that can put uh, people outside of that world into, um, I don't know, like a, a sense of displacement from it, I suppose. Um, and I, I wanted to reckon with that in that I was bringing friends and family members into that world and having them removed, their, like their existence, I suppose, removed from this, these portraits of them that were being presented. Um, I sort of had that real moment when I had some friends that I photographed come to an opening and just seeing them witness other people perceive them and talk of them as if they were bodies removed from a person, uh, which is kind of what photography does. And I'm trying to sort of talk about or think about uh, photography as a historically, like a, true, a medium that's historically been seen as one of truth and, you know, um, honesty and reality or something. And what that means in a contemporary sense is very different, especially when most people now have some sort of relationship to photography, you know, on their phones or whatever. Um, so my practice has expanded and merged a little bit since my initial studio photography. And I'm now looking at redefining my relationship to pho photography as a, as, a, uh, as a medium, my relationship to the camera as a tool, and also thinking about what a camera can actually be. So um, I've started doing other things. Um, these portraits were taken at uh, in Syracuse at a place called uh, Syracuse, New York, which is an upstate New York. Um, I did a residency there in 2018 and came across a um, South Sudanese community all the way over there. And it felt really interesting to have positioned myself in this context and talked about my relationship to this country as a migrant, as a refugee, as a displaced person, as a South Sudanese person, and maybe coming to terms with the maybe international nature of the ways that people like me are perceived in the world and what that means in a contemporary art sense um, and the idea of like, you know, being consumed or whatever. Uh, so these works were, yeah, kind of about placing myself into these, uh, into this lens that I'm trying to unpack with portraiture, what it means for me to be taking a picture of somebody. Um, yeah. And then recently, as of the lockdown, I've been using my uh, designated two hour walk to pick up flowers and things off of the Merry Creek Trail and using like not my camera to take photographs and trying to sort of unpack what a portrait actually can be and how to synthesize the image of a person without necessarily using their face. So this has been done with a scanner. I've recently been using um, a microscope to take portraits of people um, and just kind of maybe detracting from relying on bodies to talk about ideas because there's a lot of responsibility when a body becomes a concept or an idea. Uh, and that's sort of me. <laughs> I'll leave it at that for now. That was fantastic. Thank you, Atong. Um, such amazing images uh, and we're going to come back to that but well, I can see the questions and I might start to ask the questions. So 
for Kimberly. It was um, how did you find the process of attaining your position within an arts background? I think it's wonderful that cultural materials are being ad addressed from your perspective and that things are beginning to change. Um, how did I attain my position? Um, well, I suppose it, a lot of the work that I've done, you know, has been experience-based. So I, I did an undergraduate degree, but I didn't study curatorial studies or, or museum studies. Um, I, I, you know, went straight from university basically into the museum world um, and kind of learnt about curating and learnt about interpret um, interpretation and and you know that sort of space through doing it with my community doing it with artists um, and sort of I guess built on from there um, I was really um, fortunate to um, do the West Farmers Indigenous Leadership Program um, nearly 11 years ago now I was part of the sort of first cohort for that group and it, that's a, a program based at the National Gallery of Australia which is to um, support and develop, you know, skills for Aboriginal people in, in the arts and, and particularly kind of addressing the fact that there, you know, was then and, and still continues to be a, a huge gap in Aboriginal curators in institutions and arts administration. Um, and that sort of really opened up my world in terms of, of connections and um, experiences both with, you know, mentors, but also um, Aboriginal artists across Australia. So I guess, you know, that that was really monumental for me to have that experience, which has led to different, you know, I've, I've, I've done different sort of research fellowships um, within Australia and within um, the US. I, I was a curator for the Kaligi Roo Aboriginal Art Museum um, and had a residency over there working with the work of Jambawa Marawili um, and, also did a huge amount of kind of research in the UK and, and the US um, and in Europe on cultural material, um, 19th century cultural material in these, you know, big spaces like the British Museum or Oxford University and, and all these, you know, kind of big institutions that we know about, but actually they hold a huge amount of our very important cultural material. So, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of kind of research in in that space of, of collections, um, but then also had a independent sort of practice working in contemporary art, contemporary First Nations art. Um, you know, I've, I've worked sort of in different institutions. Um, I worked with Ace Open in Adelaide and co-curated a show with Liz Knoll called Next Matriarch a few years ago. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, just how I got here was just through doing a lot of different things and really my aim is to to support community and and artists as best I can in in enabling platforms in these spaces um, and a big passion of mine is also looking at access um, for you know artists and community within institutions both in in sort of acquisition and, and exhibition but but also to objects to you know to our materials um, that we are dislocated from in many ways uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, there's a few things that have come up for, for me and I'm going to also read out another question after I've said this. One of the things that seems, the, one of the questions is, um, you know, how can you uh, demystify contemporary art? And there seems to be a repetition from all of us about in one way or another about education, whether it's educating yourself as um, Atom had mentioned, you know, if you don't get the education you want at art school, you go and do it yourself. You know, you, you have to be proactive about this. And from Shane's conversation, he also talked about um, teaching, you know, and about the role of teaching and unpacking and looking at um, contemporary art, you know, the basics of how I introduced this session. Um, and you're also, Kimberly, you're also talking about, you know, your experience through education and mentoring and having, and also, you know, Atong, you know, doing residency overseas in America. Um, I've also been on various residencies. It's an incredible way to open up a dialogue and see other cultures and be immersed in it and think about your place within society, whether it's the immediate society or where you come from. 
Um, Because I know that I thought about my um, identity quite differently when I lived, I've lived in America, I've lived in France and I've lived in the UK, just short term on residencies, but enough to be aware that um, uh, that my ideas were generated very much from where I came from and where I came from changed where, wherever I was living, um, how I felt about where I came from. Um, you know, and I also think, it, so education seems to be very important here, whether you self-educate, whether you um, go and study or whether you generate opportunities for yourself. Um, the other, the other, there is a question relating to this um, and, and, uh, and it, the question is from Erin Matthews. Um, it's been fantastic. Can you give any advice on communicating about the contemporary arts with audiences, especially in regional areas where there aren't as many opportunities to view a variety of art practices? And one of, and I'm going to open this up as well, but one of my thoughts before we even came here was thinking about looking at both public art and looking at both educational and public programs at museums. And there are many regional museums around Australia um, and children's programs are incredible. Um, and also, you know, I have to say, and I, I was never on Instagram before 2018 and I've noted that all four of us are on Instagram using our own names. <laughs> so there, there are very many venues for people to learn about what people are doing. And I do think that Instagram is limited to a point, but it does kind of open up um, references of what you can um, find about artists. And, um, but yeah, I'm going to open that up. And I'm also going to come back to asking a question to a Tom at the end. Um, so uh, Shane, do you want to answer that question? I taught in Swan Hill for two years at the beginning of my teaching career. Um, and um, it's funny, like regional areas, they had a, they had a lovely um, regional gallery there and they, they had a, a great program manager that would get things in. And I guess um, the challenge probably would be to get the people in the door and to, and to, to make it um, accessible. We've also got another opportunity now with um, all of these virtual exhibitions that have turned up. Um, that's been great um, for, for teaching students online. We can look at things from all over the world. Mm. Um, so, um, but it's, it's funny because I, I think that challenge that, that, that people have um, when it comes to, sorry, I'm trying to read it again, uh, when it comes to a, the audience approaching contemporary art, I do think it's like, I don't think contemporary art needs to change. Like to, to, I think that it's just a mindset that needs to be overcome. I think the more contemporary art people see, the more comfortable they'll be. And uh, you don't need, to, you know, I, I, I love the idea that you can approach it. I don't like, you know, you can approach it and come from where you're coming from. And, uh, and you can draw what you can from it. And then you can read the thing and, and talk to people about it. And it's, it's building knowledge. Um, so I, I quite like the idea of it, it not being, in a way, maybe the edu if there was an education surrounding it, it would just be purely about questioning and purely about um, letting people speak. Okay. Thank you. And a Tom? Yeah, I, I also agree with what Shane said just about, um, yeah, it, it being about education, letting people speak. And I think as well, because so I grew up not necessarily super regional, but I grew up on the central coast of New South Wales. Um, I didn't know I was rural until I went to Sydney Uni and I got a rural relocation scholarship. I was like, hey, no, we have a cinema. <laughs> but um, it was still like comparatively, you know, two hours and a bit outside of Sydney, definitely not a city kind of hive, hive, whatever. Um, and I found that the more exposure, again, as Shane mentioned, the more exposure I had to all these amazing different uh, kinds of art, 
And also just sort of unlearning my own relationship to what I thought art was, the more comfortable I felt in those spaces. And I, I, I have to admit that I still sometimes feel like I don't understand. And I think that's okay. Like this idea that things should just be, you know, uh, that artworks should be understood or artists should be understood is like, or like, you know, the work needs to be understood in a very, the way that you might understand a textbook or something is limiting. Um, yeah, I think... Like for me, uh, with my family and friends and people that have inadvertently been invited into contemporary art spaces because I photographed them, the best way that I've found to sort of encourage a dialogue is to just sort of present the endless possibilities of what art is. Uh, I know that my family initially thought that I'd quit doing art when I stopped painting and started taking photographs. And it was a bit of a conversation to like, rather than me immediately like, oh no, how do you not understand that anything can be art? It's like, well, let's discuss that and let's accept the fact that historically art spaces have been really exclusionary um, and still are. And perhaps it's just about me encouraging a redefinition of what art is. Like, so now when mum and I go to say like a, um, a, I don't know, a garden even, and like talking about when she acknowledges a beautiful flower in the garden, let's talk about what you like about that flower. Cause that's the language that you then use to talk about what you like or don't like about an artwork. Um, and yeah, I think again, Instagram is a really good way of doing that sort of, I think redefining maybe what people think art is and is not is a good start. Thank you. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that Atom, Kimberly and Kimberly both spoke at the Know My Name conference last week, which um, is going to be made available in two weeks. Uh, if you joined and you paid this joining fee, it, the conference took place last week. Um, and um, I would encourage everyone that's interested in women artists or their work or the ideas around feminism um, to look at this because there were some amazing talks and publication and which is at the NGA in Canberra. So the Know My Name conference was um, organised by the NGA, which is an enormous undertaking. And I'm just acknowledging for those that are in regional areas and like what Shane has said, um, you know, we're in a, a time of digital disruption with COVID-19. You know, the way that we teach, the way that we learn, the way that we're communicating at the moment has a lot of advantages for people that don't have access to seeing contemporary art because no one's had access to seeing contemporary art for the last six months in the flesh. Um, so there are some really amazing positives uh, as a result of that, and I would urge all of you to follow through with any any programs like this one that is online and there is a real need for people to learn uh, given that we have been isolated for so long. Um, as a contemporary artist I feel a responsibility to say yes whenever I'm included or invited into showing in regional um, uh, museums and spaces and I've always said yes when people have asked me because um, I think it's really important that work just gets out there. Contemporary artists are contributing to where work goes. And you do have a choice. A lot of artists, um, you know, choose, choose, uh, you know, choose what's right for them. Okay, there's another question. Um, okay, thank you. This is from Jack. Um, Thank you. Presenting artists, a great number of contemporary visual artists are producing work that challenges traditional notions of what is beautiful, what are art materials, who are subjects, what and where are the expected means of artwork presentation. So how contemporary artists better offer, better help audiences approach and grapple with their work given that, given all that might be unfamiliar to them? Uh, I think we've actually I think we've kind of answered that. Do, do we think, does anyone else want to add to that? I just wanted to add to the, the earlier conversation um, that might speak to this a little bit, but, it, and I agree with, you know, you all in terms of um, education and, and that space, but I think 
you know, contemporary art isn't the problem. The institutions that that's, that it sits within is the problem. Mm. You know, so that's the barrier often between, you know, the, the audience coming through that it may, and it may not be a, a contemporary art audience, um, you know, so it's about um, how do we engage, you know, all communities mm. in different ways and how, how do people see themselves reflected in these spaces as, you know, culturally safe spaces, as spaces that aren't for the art elite, um, but, you know, spaces that they can actually come into and, and consider and, and experience contemporary art. And it might be, you know, performance art or something really abstract right to right through to something that, that could, could be more kind of um, easily interpreted. But, yeah, I suppose that's just my comment on that is how, how, how are institutions, art spaces addressing you know, that connection. And, and like you said, Cathy, you know, um, public programming plays a really important role within that. Um, and there's sort of shifts, I think, like the um, the Shepherd and Art Museum, um, which I'm deputy chair of the board of, um, is, is not long away from opening. And it's an extraordinary building. Um, Rebecca Coates and the team there have been working really hard in, and the council, Shepherd and Council, for many years in, in making this happen and, and really creating a space for regional um, community to come in and and part of that approach and part of that shift for that organization is also creating space for the Aboriginal art gallery of Shepherd and Kayila Arts to have a space um, within the building as well and to actually um, integrate and collaboratively work with you know the first people's artists and, and art center that still retain autonomy and, and you know have a self-determined space there but are very much a part of this this conversation with the art museum so that's really exciting to see yeah Rebecca is a very inclusive director I think and um it's very exciting to see that that is opening soon the building looks amazing um and I do agree with you about public programming because as a practitioner I've been involved with children's programs and also speaking publicly in those programs where there's big shows you're included in the show. The children's programs, I think, are really important because that's the dialogue that starts early on. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, we don't, we have a government that doesn't support contemporary art or, content, or doesn't support the arts um, in, a, in a way that they support um, sport. Um, and it really is important that, um, you know, uh, children, you know, learn early on or that it's just, the norm that they go in and do children's programs. Um, I never experienced that when I was growing up at all. And I love seeing that. I love seeing my daughter experience that. But um, but I also think it's the government dialogue as well that doesn't help us at the moment. But there are a lot of things that we can do that are proactive as individuals, as educators, as people working in museums, as people, artists putting work out there. Um, you know, as Esther's organised today. Um, Atonga, I'm just going to open it up to you again just to see if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Um, I really like Kim bringing up the responsibility of institutions because, uh, yeah, I think uh, on the, the Know My Name panel, uh, we had a, I was on a panel that was at the end of the festive, of the conference, sorry, um, called Future Practices, and it was about sort of where to from here, you know, with the understanding that most participants had listened to the majority of the conference up until then. It's like, what do we do with all of this enthusiasm, all of this understanding, education and so on? Where's the future? And it does feel quite challenging when that responsibility to guide an entire community or um you know, city or whatever is placed on the shoulders of the artists who are already trying to sort of establish what am I trying to say? How do I say it? Who am I saying it for? And I think at the end of the day, a lot of us artists are sort of um, what we do and how we do it is dictated by where we can, whether it's where we can based on funding, where we can based on the kind of art that we do and what spaces want to present that work um, a lot. And then, of course, like where we can based on this global pandemic that we're trying to navigate. And a lot of artists also have to reckon with whether a space is accessible, physically, you know, emotionally accessible and so on, whether it's a safe space um, for them to exist as the people that they are, um, all of that stuff. And I think 
uh, one of the things that I mentioned on that panel, and I think it's relevant here again, is about who who's who's working for who in art spaces. And I think that relationship can maybe be discussed further um, in the sense of like, you know, to really simplify it, we've got the spaces, whether they be institutions or galleries or museums, we've got the creators, whether they be artists, writers and so on. And then we've got the audience, which is, you know, the general public with the assumption that they don't have uh, traditional art education. And who's working for who is really important. And I think I would like to imagine that uh, artists and audiences aren't necessarily the ones that should be dri the driving force we should be able to experience and, you know, have a relationship to, you know, the public spaces, private spaces and whatnot um, without feeling like we are inadequate or we're not educated enough or whatever it is. So to sort of tie it all together, I think the best way to demystify fine art or art or contemporary art, whatever in general, as well as, you know, thinking of where to go from here in the future is to really tackle that relationship and to not just like on paper say that this public art space is for the public, but to really make the public feel like that, whether it's like really, really blatant text <laughs> or um, heaps and heaps of public programs that are super duper advertised or having art that is super duper broad. Like there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm not someone that works in those spaces, so I don't have the language for it. But as a uh, person who consumes art and someone who makes art, yeah, I think things could be more blatantly available and more blatantly accessible and um yeah I mean I'm not just an artist I also like to go see art so I've I've felt like I wasn't comfortable in spaces where public art was presented um mm. and that's not a failing on my part and again it's not a failing on the part of people who like to see art mm. um yeah yeah I think that's a really important point um and uh yeah, I think I actually think where where we go to from now is actually a good point to end on. But Kimberly, were you about? Do you want to say something? You look like you. No, no. Okay. <laughs> Dane, do you want to add anything to this? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it, we the the point of yeah the um the proliferation of art and the ex and art being made available. Well. I, you know, this is another topic. I think it's a missed opportunity for the government to not invest more in art. I think um, it would be really good for everyone and it would actually be good for us internationally if they invested more in art. Um, mm. That's probably my final point on that one. Yeah. I would also, um, I agree with you 100% here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the fantastic public programs that, the recent um, Sydney Biennial did, the Nurin exhibition that Brooke Andrew curated. Um, I'm not sure if you still have a, a access to the public programs or what was going on, but I would encourage you to look at the Art Gallery of New South Wales website because that was shut down, you know, a few weeks into <laughs> this enormous international exhibition that um, uh, took over many different sites in Sydney. So if any of you, um, and I'm sure most of us did, well, didn't get to Sydney, but um, if you wanted to know more, uh, I would look at that. At Monash University, we have art forums. We did, um, we've got some of the talks with some of the artists online. Um, and I'm sure that there are many more talks online at the Art Gallery of New South Wales website. So um, there are ways to access information now in a way that there, there wasn't before this year. And, um, and I think the consciousness of artists and curators moving forward will make a difference in um, how people access contemporary art and also the question of, you know, making, making um, it accessible. I, I don't, I, I think it's very important to make it accessible. I don't know if it's important that everyone has to have a broad understanding of what's going on because I think everyone's got their own, they're bringing their own personal dialogue to what they're looking at. And I think you can't expect everyone to have the same view of what they're looking at. And that's the joy and interest in the dialogues that are raised from when, when artists and practitioners put work in public spaces. So um, thank you everyone for being here. This was fantastic uh, presentations. I really appreciate 
for all of you that presented, Shane, Kimberly, and Atong. And Esther, thank you so much for inviting us to speak. And thank you all for being here, the audience. Mm-hmm.